Foucault's lectures of Malfer Dieuvre, uh, recently translated as wrongdoing truth telling, track a history of avowal over an overwhelming uh, span of historical periods from classical Greece to the present. It presents itself as an impossible task. <clears throat> So it makes no sense to fault the text in advance for what it fails to include. Its aim is not to be historically inclusive. What I do take to be its overriding purpose is to establish a set of modifications in the practice of avowal by which veridiction, speaking the truth, le dire vrai, becomes increasingly linked with jurisdiction in penal practices. <laughs> In the sixth of these lectures, Foucault claims first that in the Middle Ages, the practice of avowal was consolidated and expanded such that regimes of veridiction became integrated with technologies of the subject. I will consider briefly how this integration works, raising the question of whether it really works as well as it's supposed to and also considering whether, whether a certain dysfunction, even a disintegration, enters into this system when we consider the specific dynamics of sexual avowal. Foucault opens these lectures by posing a general question about the problem of subjectivation. And it's a question that I think uh, resonates with some of the questions we've been discussing in my seminar, how does the individual find him or herself bound to the power that is exerted over him or herself? Government functions through the production of forms of discursive and institutional power that lay out the terms by which individuals constitute themselves as subjects of their own conduct. They are subjects in the sense of agents, but also subjected to a form of power through which their action becomes legible as the action of a subject. Such subjects are not unilaterally produced as the effect of power. Rather, one ties oneself to forms of power that are imposed, which means that power works in at least two directions. It is imposed by an authority that is outside and more powerful than the subject itself, that imposition only works, however, if the subject binds him or herself to those terms of power and forms itself through those terms. How and why do we bind ourselves and what kind of tie is this? And are we, in some sense, bound to this discourse prior to any act by which we bind ourselves? How important is this reflexive act of self-constitution to the effective operation of power and discourse? Can we also consider what it means to loosen those ties? Does one unfasten or delink oneself from such terms, and does that imply a process of deconstituting oneself as a subject? Does, it, does such a deconstitution do away with reflexivity, or does it invoke another order of reflexivity, one that challenges the legibility of the subject itself. Foucault introduces this problem with a scene of a broken promise. In the 1840s, a delusional person fails to keep his promise to his doctor, not to dwell on his delusions, and never to speak of them again. The doctor remonstrates, claiming that the patient has not kept his promise, and then administers a series of freezing showers to compel the patient to keep his promise. He asks him time and again after each shower, are you mad? And the patient does not say yes. He wants to continue to talk about his delusions and resi resist the demand. As long as he continues to talk about his delusions as if they were true or as if they were sensical, he would be breaking his promise as he spoke. But if he discounts and disavows his delusions and claims outright that he is mad, indeed claims that he is mad as a way of disavowing those delusions, then he's understood to be keeping his promise to his doctor, entering into a social compact that will indeed end the torture. 
So in the moment when the patient discounts or disavows his own delirium, he avows that he is mad. The instruction he has received is thus twofold, disavow and avow. Once he avows himself as a mad person, he becomes what Nietzsche called an animal with the right to make promises. But of course, if he's a madman with the right to make promises, and is in this sense within the social contract, or rather, one version of that contract coercively imposed upon him, then that's what he is. In the moment of compliance, then, the patient lays claim to a new truth about himself. Quote, it is true that I am mad, so my delusions are not to be considered as true, end quote, at which point he conforms to a certain account and so to a regime of truth, constituting himself as a legible subject. That's what it means to speak the truth under such conditions. His act of self-constitution can be translated this way. It is madness to claim that my delusions are true. So one truth is established by disavowing a previously held set of convictions. And in this moment of taking on the diagnostic term for oneself, self-diagnosing, the patient finally becomes compliant and is cured or on the way to being cured, or so the account goes. He's doubly subordinated to the authority, but also to the discourse of truth. And this subordination is consummated through the act of avowal. So in effect, the doctor claims, you must avow yourself as mad. And when you have accomplished or executed that avowal, you will be on the way to being cured. And only then will you have renounced the veracity of your delusions and start to operate within a different regime of truth. It matters that Foucault narrates this scene this way. He wanted a specific act, the doctor, an affirmation, I am mad. In offering that very speech act, the patient is not describing a provisional state he happens to be in. He is simultaneously taking on an identity and submitting to a diagnostic category. What is strange about this form of submission is that the subject is engaged in an act of self-making or self-constitution. Indeed, he performs two acts at once. He constitutes himself and binds himself to power, understood as the psychiatric regime of truth. He accepts the diagnosis, not reluctantly, but actively begins to understand himself within the terms of the diagnosis as if his entire social intelligibility were at stake. <clears throat> In Foucault's terms, he not only agrees to the diagnosis in the way that one agrees to a contract, but the diagnosis operates as a social contract that leaves all those who fail to constitute themselves within its terms outside the limits of the social. Moreover, the one who calls himself mad trades in torture for therapeutic confinement. He not only says, I am mad, but he also says, effectively, take me away, you are right to take me away, at which point the moment of his self-constitution coincides with the moment of absolute submission. On one level, the patient learns to talk a certain way about himself, accepting a set of terms through which a self-understanding is formulated. On another level, in submitting precisely to those set of terms, the patiently effectively commits himself to a psychiatric hospital. We see the nexus of power and discourse here only because language is not only involved in a set of descriptions about who one is, but also in a form of avowal by which the subject is constituted. Although Foucault would probably not agree, I would suggest that avowal, when it works in the service of power, is a performative of the illocutionary kind. That is, it brings into being what it says. But it does this only on the condition that the conventions I use are ones that are already established as necessary for my self-constitution. So it's not by virtue of my wish or will that I constitute myself, but by virtue of the discursive conditions by which subjects can constitute themselves and remain legible to authority. Those authorities are distinguished precisely by their capacity to expel and incarcerate, to survey, to control all those who are not legible within the regime of truth that governs the formation of subjects. When I say I am mad, I become mad, but only because I take on or appropriate the diagnostician's perspective on who I am 
adopting a perspective on myself that was once external to me. In this way, I become a recognizably mad person, but only by becoming as well the one who can authoritatively di diagnose my own madness. Indeed, I cannot name myself without having the authority to do so, and that authority is derived not only from the figure of authority that compels me to avow my madness, but to the regime of truth that distinguishes the same from, but from the regime of truth that distinguishes the same from the mad. So, if avowal is a performative act, as I have suggested, it's one that requires a non-unitary subject, one made possible by a restructuring of the subject as a scene of internal surveillance and judgment. There is, however, something more. If avowal is understood as something performed for an authority who exists now in both an external and a psychic modality, we have to understand avowal as a scene of address. I am, when I avow my madness, speaking to another who is and is not me. And this is what I have to do in order to be understood as departing from my madness and on the way to sanity. Let us remember that the psychiatric hospital is waiting at the end of the speech act. And this means that the act has both illocutionary and perlocutionary dimensions. The illocutionary effect is that I am mad and become a certifiably mad person, but the perlocutionary effect is that I am now effectively committing myself to, con to psychiatric confinement or submitting myself to a form of care that is intimately linked with coercion. The voice is split that avows itself as mad. It absorbs the voice of the psychiatrist. An attribution originally imposed becomes a form of self-diagnosis. As a consequence of that avowal, understood now as absorption and reenactment of the other's interpolation, a form of reflexivity emerges that is eligible for and solicits psychiatric confinement. On the one hand, it is through one's own verbal act that one finds oneself incarcerated. On the other hand, the verbal act in question is the notal point by which a regime of truth, a particular form of discursive power, conditions and animates an act of self-constitution in compliance with specific norms of subject formation. Thus, for Foucault, such a regime of power and truth works precisely when the one diagnosed, judged, or interpolated constitutes oneself as an identity. Time and again, he gives us examples of how the one who finally avows what he or she is speaks from a subordinate position. But what happens when we shift the discourse to the problem of sexual avowal, one that may or may not be considered mad? Does one necessarily constitute oneself as a lover if one avows one's love? Foucault writes, <clears throat> and I quote, there is an inherent redundancy in avowal that appears clearly, for example, when we avow our love for someone. We are not simply affirming the current state of things. We're not saying, it's still true that I love you in case you were wondering if things have changed. <laughs> of course, we may be saying that, but strictly speaking, the act of avowing one's love, according to Foucault, understood as a promise or a vow, is neither true nor false. It may be sincerely or insincerely undertaken, but for Foucault, that is different. He draws implicitly on Austin here, and we should not be surprised. After all, something is performed through those words. Of course, I love you is not always a promise. One could easily say, I love you and cannot be with you. I am most sorry. Have to go now. Bye. <laughs> One could even say, I love you, but I love someone else as well, so can make you no promises at all. My saying, I love you, should not be construed as a promise. <laughs> That statement could be a quite sincere way of not promising, but still rightly be considered as an avowal. Let us let the slippage from avowal to promise stand, however, and see where it leads. He writes, when the sentence, I love you, functions as an avowal, it is because one passes from the realm of the unspoken to the realm of the spoken by voluntarily constituting oneself as a lover through the affirmation of what one loves. End quote. Soon after, he makes a more general claim. In a vowel, he who speaks obligates himself to being what he says he is, end quote. 
And then again, a few pages later, a vowel is a verbal act through which the subject affirms who he is, end quote. I wonder about that link between a vowel and the constitution of identity, since one can say, I love you but cannot be your lover, and people do say that sort of thing all the time, or probably saying it right now, somewhere in the world, maybe even in this town, but who knows. <laughs> For Foucault, it seems important that one avows oneself as a certain kind of identity when one avows one's love. Why should that be? Well, in his view, we would not be able to understand the effect of such an avowal as self-constitution. Of course, the analogy at work here is between the lover and the criminal, or indeed the mad person. Since the criminal, in confessing the crime, in avowing publicly that yes, he was the one who committed the crime, constitutes himself as a criminal. And similarly, a person who is said to be mad by a psychiatric authority is compelled to avow his or her madness, and so through the avowal to become mad, to say, I am mad. I'm not sure that the avowal actually works as well as it's supposed to. In English, at least, to say, I am mad, is usually a way of saying that one is in a state or condition, possibly a very protracted one. One can even say, I was mad for years, or even more importantly, I've been mad on and off for years, suggesting an intermittent condition but not precisely a continuous identity. Uh, who is the I who says, I am mad? It is unclear whether the I becomes fully mad, totalizing itself as an identity, when it says, I am mad. Are we sure that the I becomes what it says it is when it says, I am mad? Or has the I, in adopting the perspective of the diagnostician, the one who's supposedly not mad, now, uh, that, one, that I now begins to engage in self-diagnosis, miming and absorbing the diagnostic voice of the one who is supposedly not mad, and so engaging in various forms of self-diagnosis. Oh, that was just my OCD moment, or wait a moment, I need to combat that old paranoia of mine so I can hear you better. What if the very sentence, I am mad, making use of that ontological copula, <coughs> apparently determining me ontologically once and for all, is said with sarcasm or incredulity or bitter mimicry, indicating that one is all too knowing about how the attribution of madness works and is working it for other purposes. If we are relying on a spoken utterance to make the case that we are compelled to constitute ourselves as an identity, then we are also obligated to consider all the various intonations and phatic dimensions of spoken speech its dramatic and rhetorical formulations that can turn or defeat the apparent meaning of the utterance. And even if we're speaking in a court or a psychiatric hospital, we could very well repeat such words in a way that conveys non-compliance. In Shakespeare, indeed, this happens all the time. Someone asks whether someone else is mad. Usually, the person interrogated is suffering from an unbearable grief. In Hamlet, Guildenstern poses the question, are you mad? And Hamlet replies, I am but mad north northwest. When the wind is southerly, I know a hawk from a handsaw. <laughs> so Hamlet concedes that he's intermittently mad, depending on which way the wind is blowing. I have more to say about all those H's, hawk, handsaw, hands, hand, <laughs> handsaw, and Hamlet. Anyway, um, uh, um, the other example from Shakespeare, one that Lacan considers, is that of Constance in King John. I am not mad. This hair I tear is mine. Okay. <laughs> in French and in English, being mad, être fou, fal, can simply describe a situation one is in, like Hamlet's seasonal madness, but not an invariant dimension of who one is. We know this as the difference between a conditional state and a fixed identity, designated by the Latin stare esse, or the Spanish estar ser. It seems, then, what, that to accept what Foucault has to say here, we would have to track how the discourse on being mad can move from stare to esse. It's perhaps only in relation to the demand to accept the psychiatric diagnosis that the adjective begins to designate a situational state and then to expand to become an ontological determination worthy of the non-form of identity, at which point one is not only certifiable but classifiable, belonging to a broader class of those who are mad and so subject to any number of medical and security measures. <laughs> 
But is it possible to draw these analogies between avowing love, madness, and crime in the way that Foucault does? Do such speech acts become modes of constituting oneself as a discrete identity? Although one can surely be madly in love and sometimes acting on that love, which is distinct from avowing it, right? You can act on it and not avow it. And sometimes avowing or acting on love can be criminal. Sometimes even the avowal of one's love without ever acting on it can be criminal as well, depending on what country you're living in. Perhaps when we merge the three figures together into the figure of the pathologized homosexual whose love is considered criminal, that love, madness, and crime work together as an historical constellation that we can at least identify. Maybe this figure is already merged in Foucault's text, which might suggest the implicit analogies he draws among them. But if that particular figure does not gather up these terms into a set of analogies, are we right to accept the move? If a woman loves a woman and avows that love, is she therefore claiming that she is a lesbian? I don't think so. Indeed, she may simply have range. You won't think that's funny? I thought that was really <laughs> funny. <laughs> We're made nervous, right? We're made really nervous. Like, oh, is it okay if we think that's okay? <laughs> like, because we're supposed to like avow our identity, right? And that's affirmative. Okay. <clears throat> And Foucault is the one who tells us quite clearly that acts and pleasures do not need to be unified under a single category of identity, that identity can be a trap, even its own prison. Queer Theory 101. In an interview given in May of 1981, he points out that it would never occur to anyone in classical Greek culture, and I quote, to identify someone according to their type of sexuality. And then continues, in my opinion, as important as it may be, tactically speaking, to say at a given moment, I am a homosexual, over the long run in a wider strategy, the question of knowing who we are sexually should no longer be posed. It is not then a question of affirming one's sexual identity, this is still Foucault, but of refusing to allow sexuality as well as the different forms of sexuality the right to identify you. The obligation to identify oneself through and by a given type of sexuality must be refused, end quote, 1981. So we know that Foucault does not favor this self-constitution as identity, and he understands it precisely as a way of ceding power to dominant discourse at the very moment in which we constitute ourselves as an identity. This does not stop him from speaking elsewhere about new forms of subjectivity for lesbian, gay, and bisexual people, ones that may well trouble those very concepts and their interrelations. In the subject and power, he famously remarked, and I quote again, maybe the target nowadays is not to discover what we are, but to refuse what we are. We have to promote new forms of subjectivity through the refusal of this kind of individuality which has been imposed on us for several centuries, end quote. But whatever those new forms of subjectivity may be, they are precisely not developed in response to an inquisitorial question. They're not ceding to the police. Indeed, they enact forms of refusal and are ways of participating in the formation of a new political will. If avowal always involve, involves disavowal, um, then it is an implicit form of disavowal that does not take the form of the speech act. This we might understand as a kind of repudiation that comes closer to the sense of denial or repudiation, uh, what in French is called denegation. The disavowal takes place through the act of avowal and does not have to be a separate act. Indeed, disavowal can be understood as the implicit counteraction of the speech act of avowal. Conversely, the refusal to constitute oneself as an identity may well imply the shaping of a new subjectivity, but in such a way that subjectivity is not reducible to identity. Just as avowal, disavowal is a double action, an action that creates and negates, so the shaping of new subjectivity makes use of a different kind of double action, refusing and shaping. How do we know the difference? We can only know the difference by asking the question, where is the policing of identity in the scene? Is there compliance or refusal in relation to the police demand? And if there is refusal, how does that become part of the process of creating and forming new modes of subjectivity that retain and sustain that refusal as part of the task of subject formation? <clears throat> 
This may seem like a clear distinction, and sometimes it is, but to understand how compliant self-constitution contains within itself the possibility of refusal and a non-identitarian possibility of shaping subjectivity, I think we have to return to the act of avowal itself. I think we can see that avowal takes on a very specific meaning for Foucault when he claims that the act of avowal is an act of self-constitution and further, that self-constitution implies taking on an identity. What if anything keeps avowal serving that function? Can it serve others? Does it carry within itself the possibility of refusal as I've suggested? Can we accept the notion that avowal can be an act of self-constitution within the terms of power without claiming that what is constituted is an identity. Can we even agree that self-constitution always takes place through discursive means that are to some degree imposed without concluding that a vowel reproduces the categories of identity that serve the purposes of the diagnostic police? The situations that Foucault analyzes are precisely those in which the person who avows what he has done, the criminal, what he feels, the lover, and who he is, the mad person, performs a self-totalization in front of the one who demands this very avowal. In other words, self-constitution as a discrete and fully determined identity, such as criminal, homosexual, mad, involves giving oneself over to a discourse that comes from an authority. It also has to be understood as a mode of address. So if it is a performative, it has to be understood as a performative mode of address. One avows what one has done, what one feels, who one is, to someone, even if that other is anonymous or imaginary or internal. A vowel is a scene of address. It's directed to someone. But more than that, it's a response to an interpolation, a way of responding to having been addressed. Yes, you are right. I am what you say I am. Now can I be served breakfast? One concedes something, one gives up resistance, one delivers oneself into the hands of a discourse that confirms the authority of the one who has asked you to constitute yourself in the terms of that discourse. But there's always a you who bespeaks that discourse, who becomes a figure for the discourse, an anthropocentric figure who speaks to you and before whom to whom one speaks. For Foucault, in this late work, if I take on the name, the category that I am given by someone, someone who speaks and enforces a discourse of power, and in doing so, I bind myself to that name and to that identitarian truth of who I am, um, then what happens? Well, whatever heterogeneity characterizes experience for me is gradually consolidated, and my experience becomes my experience as this identity that I am. This happens gradually in at least two ways. I more and more bind myself to that truth, which means that more and more I become consolidated under that rubric. I become increasingly unthinkable and unrecognizable without reference to that truth. Secondly, that requirement to avow spreads more broadly across society so that more and more people act in the same way that I do. And that practice becomes established as a norm, one that establishes the conditions of social recognizability itself. Everyone avows who he is as an individual, but individuality is an emphatically social form, which means that the logic of identity is invoked and reproduced through every such avowal, which in turn means that when I avow an identity, I am bound to others who are doing the same act under a similar constraint. So I'm hardly alone when I take on such a discursive category, such as criminal or mad or homosexual, since as I take it on, so too do others, and it spreads and consolidates as a norm. So as each of us, through avowing the rightness of the discourse by which we are named, binds ourselves more tightly to the discourse, our speech act becomes less and less an individual act, even as it totalizes us as individuals, even though the individual costs are significant. I only become an identity through a repudiation of some kind, and this totalized I is, this always, re is always reckoning with the repudiation that is the implicit and forceful condition of its own possibility. We are not precisely within the domain of Hegel's lordship and bondage, for I'm not just bound to the other who requires that I call myself by this or that name, 
and that I become precisely that name. I'm also bound to the discourse that the other imposes on me. So the speech act is a relation to another, a mode of address, a form of response, but also the instantiation and furthering of a discourse, and so not much more than a moment of its growth and spread. This I thinks it's offering up the truth of itself in a discourse of identity to satisfy the one who demands this of me to avoid the torture that one demands, even to compel the torturer to love me. But the subject and the subject's moment of avowal becomes, much to its humiliation, a nodal point in the proliferation of a discourse. For I do not just bind myself to the other who demands that I identify myself. I bind myself to the discourse, which augments its power and reach through my avowal. My avowal is one of many such avowals. The power of discourse is not simply to establish the terms of what is true, but to reproduce that truth through compelling acts of avowal by which subjects constitute themselves explicitly through those very terms. The power of discourse depends on subject constitution, and the subject can only constitute itself by accepting and avowing the terms of that discourse, which Foucault tells us are the terms of identity. Even if I do not publicly disavow who I have been, I must repudiate that heterogeneity to become consolidated as an identity. That repudiation, I want to suggest, is the condition of possibility of the cathexis or the binding that I undertake in relation to the authoritative categories of identity. The social domain of discourse enters not simply by virtue of being addressed by another and avowing this truth of who I am before or to another. I have to be witnessed and I have to be heard, which means that I enter into a visible and audible field, a set of visible and audible fields, and those fields are already structured by what can be seen and what can be heard. In other words, my avowal can only be heard within a field of audibility that is already structured to accept what I say. So my individual act of avowal takes place in a discourse within a visual audible field already structured in certain ways, and it's my compliance with those structures that lets my avowal be understood and accepted. The sight of that discursive power moves from the authority who articulates and demands that I take on that discourse to the scene in which I avow it as my own, begin to speak it and to name myself within its terms. So my avowal is hardly a mechanical repetition. I take on the voice of the other as my own. I absorb that voice, a mode of interiorization that splits my voice so that I am at once the one speaking and the one spoken of. Who needs an external authority to impose terms upon one's life if the structure of the subject absorbs and recapitulates that authority, starts diagnosing itself, starts, starts incarcerating itself? The properly consolidated subject of identity is the criminal and the judge, the patient and the diagnostician. I diagnose and condemn myself. I sentence myself to prison. I commit myself to the psychiatric hospital. In a way, it seems we are referring to a subject who amplifies and aggrandizes itself as it absorbs and reenacts the voice of the one who imposes that dominant discourse and constitutes itself precisely as the identity it is required to be. It announces itself as an identity, but in fact, it has become a kind of scene. And though this is my way of putting it, it will be Foucault who claims that avowal belongs to the order of drama and dramaturgy. After all, speech is now polyvocal, polyvocal. The doubling of myself that I perform in order to avow my identity suggests that I cannot possibly become an identity. Indeed, the very conditions of self-naming demand that I not be the one who is identified in a certain way, for otherwise the one who names would lose the power to name. For that power to exist, the one who names must not be the one named, must stand at an own distance, split off, separated from the one who is named. In other words, it's now the social discourse that becomes articulated in the structure of the subject, a function and effect of reflexivity itself. The structure of the subject is recast as a complex and performative social field, or indeed a scene, one that is emphatically polyvocal and polyvalent, irreducible to the identity it is supposed to be ratifying. Foucault gives us all that we need to know about this division in the subject that makes self-naming possible, the act of avowing oneself as a specific identity that one is constrained to assume. 
the one who is supposed to constitute itself as an identity is split by the act of avowal, interpolating and avowing at the same time, making and assuming the demand in alternating or simultaneous fashion, enacting the scene of compulsory address as the structure of the subject or what we might, what we might now call its psychic scene. That splitting is both the condition and effect of the act of avowal itself. So, in effect, I'm suggesting that in avowing what I am, I come apart into a social scene, a scene that is at once social and psychic, of demand and compliance, judgment and avowal, and that means that my identifications, as it were, are as both judge and judged. I'm already failing to be an identity as a consequence of my assiduous effort to comply with the terms of identity. Okay, that I'm going to let go as I move then uh, to another point, which is simply this. Um, I want to suggest that the disavowal that is operative in a vowel does not take the explicit form of a speech act. It's the countercurrent of deformation and denegation that conditions the possibility of the avowal of identity. Okay, so then, um, if the early Foucault sometimes wrote as if discourse simply and effectively produced a subject, right? That's the Foucault we learned, early Foucault. That formulation is repeated and revised through the late 1970s and early 1980s. The notion that the subject is only produced through practices of self-constitution formed the central concern of the ethical writings, the, the care of the self, le souci de soi. What then distinguishes the late lectures on fearless speech and wrongdoing truth-telling is precisely a concern with public and dramatized speech that takes place within a specific scene of address. Just as speech becomes an important permutation of discourse, so authority becomes an important dimension of power. Discourse is both reproduced and derailed through scenes, public scenes, of enunciation. Of course, Foucault's account of the discursive production of the subject could never be construed as a behaviorism. There was always the possibility of a counter discourse and sometimes active forms of resistance and refusal. If we think about sexual avowal, does that change the terms of this description, allowing us to see how counter discourse and resistance return to the scene of discourse and power? To do this, I think we have to take three more steps. Are you with me still? That's good. <clears throat> First, we probably have to understand disavowal, understood as denegation, to understand avowal. And I understand there is now in a recently published set of lectures an entire discussion of ideological denegation, which I have not read. Okay, but I said this before I found that. Okay. If avowal requires disavowal, what follows? Second, we must consider the act of binding oneself to, po to power um, follows a solicitation, a seduction, and can itself be understood as a cathexis, a binding of libido or energy or the heterogeneity of the will to an authority that has to do with love and often with the fear of losing love, which is, of course, crucial to Freud's account of why it is we sometimes obey illegitimate authority. Freud tells us that we affirm authorities from the fear of losing their love and that we even take, and I quote, an unattackable authority into ourselves through a mechanism of incorporation to save that authority from any possible attack that we ourselves may want to launch against it. Foucault doesn't go in that direction, but he does recount the story of Antilochus, who allows Menelaus to receive a prize that rightfully belongs to himself. In effect, Achilles is willing to affirm this injustice and renounce the prize. In Foucault's words, Antilochus avows the following, even if you want more than this prize, I am ready to give it to you because I do not want you, Menelaus, to put an end to your love for me. Well, what's the nature of this bind, this tie, when we take the unattackable authority into ourselves and populate our subjective lives with dramatic agonisms such as these? Is it love or desire? Does it have a sexual quality? And is it both the tie that binds us to subordination and the decathexis or excess which provides a possible resource for refusal? We know that for Foucault, sexuality is not the source of any grand revolt. He makes this clear in the History of Sexuality, Volume 1. 
But does that mean that sexuality plays no role at all in the act of binding oneself to authority and the prospect of a more radical unbinding and deconstitution of the subject and its identity? Third, I think it's useful to consider Foucault's Oedipus to understand more precisely how sexual avowal disturbs the scene of power. This takes us then to the broader question of Foucault and psychoanalysis toward which I can only gesture within the confines of this lecture. Foucault's examples of avowal on occasion include, as I mentioned, the avowal of love. He writes that avowal modifies the relationship to what is avowed, indicating that the speech act of avowal is relational and that the avowal of love acts on, transforms the relation between the speaker and the recipient. He writes, to show, oh, to avow one's love means to begin to love in another way. Since avowal is not a vehicle that conveys love as something intact, the avowal of love modifies that love, and love now becomes an avowed love, which is really quite some, something quite different from what it was before. Indeed, all the trouble seems to start at this particular juncture. In this example, we see how the avowal of love can be quite different from the avowal of a crime, though this is complicated by avowing forms of love that are considered criminal. In the example of crime, avowing what one has done is supposed to take some distance from that crime. But what if it does the opposite? One avows the crime because one's proud of it, wants publicity for having committed it, fully intends to commit it again and to encourage others to commit the crime as well. In such a case, the speech act cannot be separated from its instrumentalization for contrary purposes. Antigone was pun punished not only for doing the deed, but for owning the deed as her own, an avowal that was considered to be a direct affront to Creon's authority. Indeed, the avowal produces a kind of counter discourse at the moment of its utterance, promoting a crime in the act of, of, of admitting it. Similarly, one can avow one's love in the midst of withdrawing it, which in no sense calls into question the sincerity of the utterance. I love you, but I cannot live with you or be your lover, or I love you and I cannot love you. That's, that last is a perfectly plausible, if painful, formulation. How do we explain the countercurrent that runs through the speech act, one that unbinds as it binds, that suspends the relationship it is meant to ratify, and that keeps us from being able to define the identity of the one who speaks? In the second of these lectures, Foucault remarks upon Oedipus as an individual, and I quote, who bears a truth that will devastate him, and that consequently he must reveal by himself this manifestation and the procedures of manifestation will not unfold within the form of the agon. For Oedipus, the act of avowal will deconstitute his political power, to be sure. For Foucault, the point is to concentrate on Oedipus's veridiction, his speaking of the truth, the conditions that lead to his speaking the truth of what happened. He does not have the narrative of what happened, though at some level he seems to know it. The dramatic and legal structure of the text requires that evidence be brought forth from several sources and that the slave who refused to carry out the order to have the infant Oedipus killed offers the evidence that leads Oedipus to recognize that yes, he is the one who committed that crime of incest and that crime of parricide. The play follows a juridical procedure that seeks to compel recognition or an agnoresis. Foucault wants to say that there are two moments of recognition in Oedipus Rex. In the first moment, Oedipus is obligated to recognize who he is, that is, the kinship relations that establish who his parents are. In this case, it matters, since if he were not the son of Laius and Jocasta, he would simply be having sexual relations with his lawful wife. There would be a little intergenerational issue, but no one would be too upset. <laughs> He would have killed some stranger on the road who refused to get out of his way. Okay. The latter might be a crime, but it wouldn't strike at the foundational links between kinship and society. Knowing who he is, from what filiation he descends, repositions his relationship to the one he loves and the one he killed, and so transforms the nature of his crimes. There is, however, a second form of anagnoresis that Foucault calls individual, and pertains to the emergence of truth in the subject. This last form might be called the dawning recognition of what has happened that leads to the public avowal of these deeds, now understood as very specific crimes. He refuses to recognize his deeds as crimes, but as the truth is produced through at least three different scenes where evidence is presented, Oedipus does finally recognize and avow 
the truth, converting his deeds into crimes. Prior to that full recognition, Oedipus has only denigation to offer. The chorus allegorizes the situation, saying, I cannot believe what Tiresias has said. I can neither believe it nor refute it. What can I say? I do not know. That's the chorus speaking, but it's also obviously speaking for um, Oedipus. He refuses what is said, but also the authority of the one who makes the accusation. I refuse to speak because I'm not, a for I'm not forced to obey you. At this moment, Oedipus speaks as the king. And yet it's the slave who finally gives the most crucial bit of evidence so that when Oedipus recognizes his crimes, he recognizes as well that the one without power is under the greatest compulsion to tell the truth. So Oedipus does not really engage in introspection. He doesn't seek to discover a truth in himself. Rather, he's struggling against, and I quote from Foucault, the legitimate production of truth that is juridically acceptable and that is effectively accepted by the chorus, end quote. Oedipus is himself seeking to establish throughout the play a new judicial practice that made avowal an essential piece of the judicial system, end quote. But when Oedipus recognizes his deeds as the crimes that unpunished spread illness and disease throughout the city, does he also recognize his identity? Is that really what's going on? Foucault says that's what he's doing. But I think we're confronted with an ambiguity. Does he accept the identity as criminal? Or is it that once he understands his identity in relationship to his parentage, filiation, he recognizes that his crimes are indeed incest and parasite and that that's the proper name for the crimes. It seems that the recognition of his parentage precedes and conditions the recognition of his crime or that they are simultaneous. But it would be hard to argue that Oedipus constitutes himself as an identity in relation to the interrogation that finally produces evidence of his crimes. His, it's his deeds that are renamed as crimes only because he himself turns out to be of different parentage than he had thought. But what he is, that is to say his kinship position, is in itself not particularly criminal. Once the slave presents evidence that Oedipus was in fact the infant who was not killed, but given to some shepherds to raise, Oedipus realizes he was that infant and so the one who did those deeds now suddenly recast as crimes. The sequence has to be established. Testimony has taken narrative form based on evidence that can be corroborated. Does Oedipus's scene of recognition give support for Foucault's theory? Can the play be called upon as evidence for the theory? What, if any, is the relation between the evidence that finally compels Oedipus's recognition and the evidence that Oedipus Rex, the play, gives that Foucault's account of avowal is right. Let's remember that for Foucault, avowal is not the same as confession. Avowal is a later concern. It emerges as part of the sacrament of penance, not before the 11th or 12th century. Its institutionalization within monastic institutions is the most uh, significant historical moment of its development. It's in relation to forms of a of obedience that avowal is understood as the act by which rules of conduct come to penetrate one's entire behavior. That's Foucault's language. This is variously described as a total penetration by someone who is in a position of subordination, right? So the person who is in a, a position of subordination is totally penetrated by uh, this particular uh, identity category that is avowed. We might ask whether this project of a total penetration is in fact ever possible, whether it functions precisely as an unrealizable phantasm, if not a sexualized fantasy of power within the sacraments of penance. In any case, Foucault claims that it was one of the great accomplishments of the church in the 12th and 13th century to establish a juridical model that governs the ritual of penance. That ritual required an oral confession, and one aspect of this was, interestingly, free association, the obligation to say whatever it is that is in one's heart. Through this form of confession, oriented both to the sacred texts and the enigmas of the self, truth was uh, uh, not manifested in a form, I'm sorry, truth was now manifested in a form that was entirely verbal and entirely juridical. It became less important to display one's sin or remorse through bodily gestures and facial displays, which was the prerequisite of exomologesia. Now, the revelation of truth and the possibility of contrition were entirely focused on the verbal act. 
Actus Veritatis, he tells us, emerged quite late in 15th century texts. A verbal act then took place in a sacramental structure in a fully juridified form. Although one of Foucault's aims here is to give us the monastic prehistory of Freud and psychoanalytic procedure, elsewhere he makes clear that Freud's own form of textual analysis derives from Jewish traditions of Talmudic readings. Yet for the purposes of this very broad history, he tells in these lectures, the practice of a vowel was consolidated in the Middle Ages. In the sixth lecture, he makes clear that a vowel is beset by fault lines, that it does not always work. But if prior to this point in the text, Foucault has given us the logic of how a vowel is supposed to work, he now makes clear that there was no fortunate coincidence between the author of the crime and the subject who had to account for it. The avowing subject shows itself to be what he calls a cumbersome figure, on the one hand, indispensable to the working of the penal system, but prone to failing, to not working. The relationship between Foucault and psychoanalysis might be glimpsed here at the question under what conditions does a vowel fail to work? What if someone who committed no crime avows that he's committed the crime, or someone who committed a greater crime admits to a lesser one? What if the language in which the judicial proceeding takes place is different from the language of the one who is accused of a, of a crime? What infelicities happen in the midst of translation when the very conceptualization of the crime may well not be the same for the parties to the case? Foucault remarks that the avowing subject says less than what he is supposed to, but also more than is asked of him. He concludes that, and I quote, far from being the keystone of the penal system, this figure of the avowing subject, here I quote again, opened an irreparable breach in the penal system, end quote. For the most part, when he describes a vowel, Foucault focuses on what its aims are, how it's supposed to work, so he gives us the ideal under which the practice takes place. He doesn't tell us very much about the ways in which the practice fails to work and indeed comes to constitute an ir irreparable breach in the system. Why irreparable? What cannot be repaired? The need for a vowel on the part of authorities or more broadly an entire penal system can become derailed and go aw awry when something escapes from this procedure, when no response is given or a different kind of response is given. Both of these are instances of non-compliance. The avowal has to fulfill the dramaturgical conditions, so it will not do simply to make a punctual confession. It has to be staged, it has to be explained, the causal intelligibility of the act has to be recounted, and that narrative structure has to fulfill certain dramaturgical expectations. But that very dramaturgical condition holds the potential to go another way. If the performative speech act is to some degree dramatic, then it does matter how it's staged with what directions and how the body of the speaker comes into play. As soon as avowing a crime becomes a formula, or as soon as avowing one's love becomes a formula, then the one who speaks within its terms, the one who avows guilt or love or even madness, disappears into its iterable form. Foucault himself opens up this possibility at the end of his lectures. He writes, after all these many hundreds of pages, the problem with the vowel is that it tells you nothing. He, <laughs> he, the accused, could tell you anything. And then apparently addressing an imaginary judge within the text, Foucault says, can you condemn someone to death you do not know? End quote. So what is not known, even unknowable, is secured and safeguarded by the act of a vowel once that act assumes this iterable form, once it becomes a norm. This insight corresponds, I would suggest, with the notion that every explicit avowal requires a denegation that does not always appear in the form of an explicit verbalized act. That denegation becomes what keeps the law from totalizing the subject and the subject from constituting itself successfully as an identity. It designates the sphere of another mode of desire and mode of subjectivity beyond the terms of identity. Precisely because the law does not, cannot, fully penetrate every aspect of one's being, it produces a subject more knowing about the law and less known by the law, which produces a dangerous subject, one against whom society must be defended. Thank you.